episode two of the Business of Enterprise IT podcast. And I'm Josh Davis, Marketing Director, and Scott Davis, Vice President of InfoSystems. And uh, Scott, in the last episode, we focused a lot, and we were talking about cloud and the cloud infrastructure that we're building out um, to offer you know, a production-ready environment for our customers. And we talked a lot about the numbers, the uh, four nines, three nines, four nines, five nines, those numbers. Uh, we talked about tier three, what the data center, center standards and uh, some things like that. So do you think we did an okay job of explaining that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we hit it at a high level. I mean, obviously there's a, there's a lot deeper dive that you could take, but yeah. You know, I think what we're trying to do with these discussions is keep things at a business level mm -hmm. so that someone who's not necessarily a technologist by trade can, you know, listen to the conversation and get a good understanding of what they need to know to, you know, uh, make some technology decisions for their businesses moving forward. Yeah. So, no, we thinking about the, the SLAs, what four nines mean, what data center standards are. Can you think of anything we might have left out of that discussion? Are there other important numbers that people, or that uh, involves cloud offering and data mm -hmm. center that, that we didn't really talk about last time? Yeah, you know, as I was just kind of preparing for this discussion today, I was thinking through this and just some of my own personal experience lately. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, last night my wife texts me in a panic and she's like, my cell phone, I can't make any calls. Yeah. And, you know, I got a shipment yesterday from one of the large, you know, uh, Amazon Wayfair type companies and it short shipped. And, and so, so just this week I've had the opportunity two times to be on the phone with a call center somewhere up in the ether trying to get help from a gargantuan company. Yeah. And uh, I'm reminded that there's a place for very large companies and they can do some wonderful things for you. If you're looking at cellular service or you're looking at, you know, buying things off the internet to have, uh, you know, delivered within two days and have a, you know, just a tremendous selection and those types of things. And, sure. and those companies have their place. But, you know, when you talk about the numbers and I was thinking about that, you know, most of the time I'll, I'll as I'm discussing SLAs and, and contract terms and conditions with customers. The bottom line is if you ever get to that in your relationship, you have real problems, right? Yeah. So while those things are important and we're certainly going to, you know, have those terms and conditions and we, we have that, those design points in our solution, I, I think the, the thing that is not only the availability in general, but the other aspect of having a relationship with an East Tennessee company is that, you know, we're not so large that when there is something that a customer needs to talk about, you end up calling into, you know, you know, one eight one eight hundred the I used to call it one eight hundred launch a prayer, right? Mm -hmm. Can I get a hold of somebody? Is the first person I'm gonna get a hold of, do they actually know me as a customer or am I a number? Yeah. Those types of things. So you know, I, I think that one of the things that we're keeping front and center as we have, uh, as we are designing, as we go through, you know, growing this capability within our um, portfolio is that this is something that we're going to stand behind and we're going to have a personal relationship with our customers. Yeah. It's going to be a face-to-face -face relationship with our customers. And when they call, we're going to pick up the phone. So, you know, we're going the extra mile to make sure that, uh, you know, we can enter that relationship in confidence that we're going to satisfy their requirements for availability as they trust us to run their, uh, their business-based applications. Yeah, and you, you know, you, without knowing it, just spearheaded right into one of the first questions I was going to ask. And, you know, moving past talking about the, the numbers uh, that are involved and talking about the, the whys, what's, and how of the offering, the cloud environment that we're building, you know, I, w I was just going to start by saying, why are we doing this? Right. And a lot of what you said answers that question, why? Because, you know, when you talk about the Amazons, the Microsofts, the Googles, 
you're not going to get personalized service there. That's just not the, it's, it's not even feasible for what right. they're doing. And so, you know, that's an important why for why we think customers will want to work with us, you know, here in Tennessee and, and in these surrounding regions because we do provide a much different experience than what you would expect from, you know, one of those major corporations. Well, we certainly hope to, right? Yeah. That That's our goal. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, relationships still matter, yeah. right? So when you're taking a, um, a component of your business, which is critical to, uh, you know, day-to-day -day operations, and you're looking at taking that, you know, from your control solely and sharing that control with another company, you certainly want to make sure that that that's a relationship that you're going to be able to live with moving forward. Yeah. And again, the, the hyperscalers have their place. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, obviously, right? They're, they're doing very well. Mm -hmm. the, the challenge that you run into them, into with them is just this, it, it's just a factor of scale. They're so big and they're so uh, dispersed that they, you lose the personal relationship. It's mm -hmm. not there anymore. You become, you, you become a line item on a, in a report and you become a, a line item in a, in a, in a revenue uh, stream. And you know, certainly you know, we're interested in revenue and all of those things as well. I mean, that's why we're in business is to make money. But at the end of the day, the way that we're going to do it is take what's, what's been the legacy of our company of InfoSystems, which has been that face-to-face -face relationship, face-to-face -face sales, you know, uh, uh, skills in, in territory, right? We have, we have technologists, level three consultants that are on staff here in East Tennessee and we're going to make those available still to our customers. Mm -hmm. So you just don't snap your fingers when you want to move from you know your legacy environment to a hosted environment or to the cloud, whatever you want to call it. Right. There's there's a process that you have to go through, and that starts off with having a relationship with someone that you can trust, and that that company bringing the skills to bear that are going to be needed to make sure that that transition can be, you know, mapped out and executed without a lot of disruption to your business. Yeah. So, you know, the why is a pretty easy question to answer. And what I think is going to be a little harder for, you know, people as we uh, bring this solution out into the marketplace for our existing customers and for new customers mm -hmm. um, is to really understand what this is and why it's different than, than other things. So. You know, one of the places I thought we could start, you know, I really want to boil this down to a business discussion because we're not really talking to um, IT specialists. We're talking right. to company leaders, business executives who want to know more about the technology that can help advance their business. Right. So what does the non-IT business leader need to know about replication and redundancy and you know, which is really the how you get to those SLA numbers that we're going to be offering. What do they mm -hmm. need to know there? Well, I, you know, I, I think you can look at it from a business aspect almost like any other function that's accomplished within your company, yeah. right? If, if you've got something that's a critical task that, ex, that, that, that ties into a core business process that if those things don't happen, you don't do what you do to, to generate revenue and to serve your customers, you, you typically don't have one of them, right? Whether that be, you know, a person or, you know, a, a building system or a material handling system or whatever. Uh, it could be a truck or a forklift. It, it makes no difference. If it is critical to the success of your business, having one is a problem because right. if that one goes away for whatever reason, you're out of business until you can get that particular uh, capability replaced. So we've taken that approach um, in building out this environment. And, and frankly, where we've seen that applied for many, many years as I've been in this business is when you get up into the much larger organizations, right? Uh, you get into the Fortune 50, Fortune 100 clients, and you look at what they have implemented for their core business applications, 
and what we've helped them to design and help them to implement. So what we've tried to do is take the knowledge and the lessons learned from all of those years working with those much larger clients and bringing that down and replicating that mm -hmm. uh, so that we can offer that level of service and availability to the mid-market and small business client here in East Tennessee and the geographies that we're going to serve. So that's what we're really aiming for. And, and, and a core guiding principle is that if it's a key component, you can't only have one of them, right? right. And so that's, that's where it starts. It's making sure that there is no single point of failure throughout the, the technology stack, which means that if there, because hardware fails, you know, things happen, uh, you know, there's power outages, you know, air handlers fail, all of those types of things can derail uh, an IT environment. So you need to make sure that in the industry we call it N plus one. We have the production plus a, plus a failover device. Mm -hmm. And that failover has to be automated as well. So that's the approach we've taken in building out what we're calling our production ready cloud. And it's something that, again, as I think I mentioned in the last uh, discussion, it's very difficult for a mid-market or small business to invest in this level of resiliency on their own because it would be cost prohibitive, let alone the staff that you would have to wrap around it, other different technologists to be able to design it, implement it, and maintain it, you know, moving forward. Yeah, I was going to ask, you know, traditionally with on-site infrastructure before cloud offerings really became the norm in the IT industry, would mid-market sized companies have failover for, for most of their IT infrastructure or would they just respond to things as they happened? You know, there, there, there are a few. There's always some outliers, but yeah. in general, you know, what I've seen is most mid-market to small businesses uh, will be doing some sort of a backup regime where they're protecting their data. Mm -hmm. uh, they may or may not have off-site data storage. You know, there are there are some today because of the way technology is moving that they might have some servers running in a different facility mm -hmm. and they might be doing some replication of a few key applications over that particular, uh, over, over the wide area network to make sure that they have copies of their applications running elsewhere. But, but frankly, uh, there are still, if you would go in and, and really boil that down and, and look at the environment from, from the facilities all the way up through the interface to the end users, right, which is really that technology stack I like to talk about, there are still, it's littered with single points of failure. Right. You know, the replication, they may not have redundant network connections, redundant firewalls, redundant routers, those types of things. Mm -hmm. So even though some firms have implemented this to a level, again, it's not going to be uh, uh, equal to something that you would typically see in a, in a Fortune 50 or Fortune 100 company. Right. They just can't afford it. It's just cost prohibitive. And, you know, talking about, as we're talking kind of comparing the differences between, you know, a typical hyperscale cloud offering versus uh, our production ready environment that we're building. I would assume that the type of equipment and the, and the way it's uh, built out in the hyperscale data centers is very different than what we're building in the data center we're currently building out in. Can you explain some of the differences uh, in what the the kind of the equipment behind the cloud offering? Right. Well, when, you know, when you get and look at the hyperscalers and how they've built their environment, without exception, I, you know, there, and there may be some pockets here and there because obviously they're huge organizations and they they may have different levels uh, that I'm not aware of. But but in in general they use what we'll call white box equipment, right? It's not, you know, it's not HP or IBM or, or, or Dell. It's, it's a, it's a third-party white box equivalent for processor. They'll typically use white box uh, cheap and deep storage. And these really, in their minds, are throwaway, right? They buy so many of them, they just have, you know, rooms full of these devices. And, 
and again, they have their purpose. Their their cost is low, mm -hmm. uh, and you know they're they just stack them up like Legos, and and uh, you know that's typically where they support most of the workloads. But again, that's a different approach than what you would see if you would go into a Fortune 50, you know, a Fortune 100 company. You, you know, you're typically going to see you know a major manufacturer in the compute space, in the network space, and in the storage space, right? And, you know, what comes along with that is a level of support that uh, each of these manufacturers provide, and they integrate with each other. So, you know, IBM talks to Microsoft, who talks to VMware, who talks to EMC, and, and you know, and Cisco works with all of them to be able to integrate all of those technologies so that as as someone who's supporting the environment, when there's an issue that I need to go off and get manufacturer level support on, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's uh, you know all of these things are paid for. We it's under they're all under support contracts, so we have numbers that we can call to make sure that if something's happening in the environment, you know, we can get a manufacturer level support on the phone to to address those issues before the customer realizes there's even a problem. Mm -hmm. So. That's a little bit different in the hyperscaler, and that's why I think when we looked at their fine print, they they had a disclaimer in there that said that, that if if something that one of our manufacturers does causes an outage, then we're not responsible for the outage. Yeah, because their manufacturer is not, you know, a traditional manufacturer in the technology industry as as we see it. They're right. they're a white box manufacturer, and their market is to sell at extremely low cost. Mm -hmm. Well, the, one of the ways that they do that is they don't invest in the support infrastructure that the IBMs, the HPs, and the EMCs and the Ciscos uh, invest in, and yeah. they don't have that capability to support their user community. Yeah. So we're building um, uh, our production-ready cloud out of major manufacturer components, tier one components. Yeah. And so we will have support for all aspects of that infrastructure and, and the, the hardware, uh, the companies that we're buying from have relationships with the Microsofts and the Red Hats and the, and the VMware so that there's a, there's, a, there's a linkage between all the different pieces of the architecture so that we can get support. And the other thing is we also get support up front where they validate our designs, you know, we we just we explain to them what our goals are, you know, what type of availability we're looking for. And so not only is it supported after it's built, but they've also validated the architecture before we even ordered it. Yeah. So it, it's just a different uh, level. And, and again, that's because we're aiming at a different market. Yeah, and I, I mean, I guess it was important for me to grasp the concept that the hardware that's in a hyperscale data center is purpose built for that environment. And they, they've got their business model in mind, what they want to deliver, how they want to deliver. But that's completely different from what we're doing, which is buying equipment that would normally be deployed in an enterprise grade data center for a, a major corporation. And we're building that out uh, for ourselves to so that we can provide that service for companies that normally wouldn't have access to that type of equipment. Correct, correct. And it, and it that permeates through the rest of the relationship as well as well as far as, you know, us still providing a face-to-face -face sales organization. Now some, you know, the hyperscalers do have face-to-face -face sales organizations, but they only call right. on the very very large customers. Right. They're not out calling on the the, the mid market and small business clients. Yep. So, um, and again, uh, you, do they have support people? Yes, they do. But they're working in a call center somewhere, sitting in a cubicle. They don't have the ability to get in an automobile and drive out to the customer's uh, facility to to help do an assessment to understand if they're even ready to move to the cloud. Yep. Those types of things. So it's just a different model. And we, you know, we talked about uh, last episode about physical access to your equipment and how important that is for, you know, if there's a move or an exit strategy that needs to be in place. But I guess it goes hand in hand with physical access to your support staff as well. I mean, we're, we have boots on the ground right here to support customers who, who may experience something. 
Re yeah, that's true, and, and, at, and at both sides, right? Yeah. Not only to go into the data center to make sure that our equipment is properly maintained and, and that it's, it's uh, uh, the care and feeding of is done properly, but also if the customer has an issue on their, on their site, right? Yeah. If they're having a problem connecting in or whatever, you know, we also have the ability to go out and help them with that, yeah. which again is something that the hyperscalers aren't even going to offer. They could care right. less. They're going to give you a network connection up in the cloud and it's your job to get there, yeah. right? And if something happens in your facility, I mean, that's not what they do, right? Yeah. So we can help at both ends. And I think, again, that gives the customer a single point of contact and a single point of accountability for you know, exploring this technology and, and making the move. You know, I just, I'm glad we got to talk through this stuff in today's episode because I, you know, I thought it was, it's really important to kind of understand why InfoSystems is making such an investment to bring this solution to the market for our customers. What's the difference in, in all of those things from a business level? I mean, it's easy to, you know, as often happens in the IT industry, a lot of salespeople are really focused on features and specs and performance and not so much on, you know, the, the real business reasons behind why this is a, a good offering or, or, or a smart investment. So, you know, I, I really am glad we talked through this today because I thought that was an important piece of the puzzle rather than InfoSystems uh, saying in the marketplace we have a cloud that's this fast and you know and start running through all of the specs and features that it doesn't really make sense to the business professional I think it makes a lot more sense to to know why why did you build this what what's it gonna mean for my company from a business business perspective so um, any last thoughts around this for today's episode? I think we're at, we've covered a lot of ground, so yeah. that's good. Yeah, and I, I think I agree with those comments, and I think the way that I've looked at this since the beginning, you know, since we started, you know, strategically planning this, you know, several years ago, is I want to be in the business of selling outcomes mm -hmm. to our clients. You know, a business owner doesn't really care how many servers he's running. He doesn't care about three nines, four nines. He doesn't care about, you know, uh, technology terms and buzzwords. What he cares about is can I take this aspect of my business and can I, can I partner with you and can the outcome be a better uh, environment and, a, and, a, and, a, and better service for, for my company for my internal clients, my employees, and for my ultimate clients, the ones who I make my money off of. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to say, hey, we're gonna give you a identifiable, guaranteed outcome for your investment. And that's very difficult to get when you're doing it in-house because yeah. you know, you can't, you're guaranteeing it to yourself. It's like we don't <laughs> insure ourselves, we go to a third party to buy insurance. So. If you want to get a guaranteed outcome, you have to go to a third party where you have a contractual relationship and you have some leverage against that, you know, that partner to be able to deliver what they say they're going to deliver. Yeah. So that's that's what I want a business owner to take away that I want to sell you an outcome that you, that you're happy with and that meets your needs. And uh, I don't want to sell you a bunch of speeds and feeds because you don't care about that to your right. day. It's a great place to leave it today. Uh, excellent conversation. Thanks again, Scott. And uh, until next time.